Hello everyone, my name is Marion with DTM Real Talk Channel. It's the channel that you can tune into, have the ability to listen to the thoughts of others about topics all over the world that touch every one of our lives. Everybody, everybody goes through basically the same thing. There is nothing new under the sun. So if you're going through, someone else has already been there. Maybe you can find hope. Maybe it's a pathway that can set you on the right road just by tuning in. So DTM, real talk, just keeping it real. And if you like it, like us at the bottom, subscribe, and let us know just how we helped you. Just keeping it real, nothing but love. Good evening. This is DTM Real Talk, and we're just keeping it real. We are back this Sunday on the edge of our seats. Yeah. And uh, oh, something in my glasses. I can't see. Oh, okay. There we go. All right. And we're just um, excited because we have Michael back. And yes. we learned last week. I mean, you know, I was sitting on the end of my seat. He <laughs> was born and raised in New Orleans. And really interesting. Your parents were not from here, one from Africa and one from, uh, what was the other place? Jamaica. Jamaica, yeah. And both of them were very intelligent with PhDs and so on and so forth. Michael's the only child, for those of you that missed the episode last week, he was the only, he is an only child and um, started off and went to college and did excelled in everything he touched, sounds like to me. And... <laughs> um, <laughs> And start out and then everything he touched, excelled, went to the military. By the way, thank you for your service. Uh, went to the military, got an honorable discharge and didn't deserve an honorable discharge. But we can hear how that happened. You know, something, anyway, uh, got an honorable discharge and found his way through being alone that led him to uh, insecurity and a difficult time of accepting himself. And mom and dad had no clue. And he brought something out very interesting last week that his father was a preacher, his mom was a professor, and they were doing what parents do. They were educating, protecting, and taking care of, but yet they had no clue of his loneliness, of his insecurity. And what did he do? We heard him last week say that he began to seek for acceptance, began to um, looking for love in the wrong places is what I mm. call it, because I did the same thing. But anyway... Mm. Uh, and some of you may have done that same thing as well, not knowing that you were going through what we call insecurity. And mm. your mom may not know, but she won't know unless you tell her that you feel in some kind of way and you don't know how you feel, little children. Y'all ain't got to be watching this anyway, but just in case you're watching it. But anyway, so even as adults, <laughs> if you're feeling that way, talk to somebody. But Michael talked about that. And he shared that and how that led him into acceptance, uh, seeking acceptance in, from other people and other groups and other things. And that began his downfall in drugs, freebasing, uh, from weed to cocaine to freebasing. And uh, Michael, we want to hear the rest of the story here. So where do we leave off last week? Uh, we left off, uh, guys just got shot, so. Yeah, that's that. oh yeah, and he was on yeah. his way down. It's probably yeah, I was on my way down. So, on his way uh, down and trying to stay down. That's crazy. People on their way yeah. down trying to get up. But anyway, yeah. go <laughs> uh, left and went to New Orleans, uh, DC uh, when my family went to uh, out of town. So, um, <clears throat> so when I got to New Orleans, when I got to DC, I stayed there for years. I never came back to New Orleans except for when I came this time. Um, I mean, I came back for vacations and stuff, but I it was really spiraling out of control. I was going to treatments. Uh, I tell people all the time, I've been to over 20, over 20 treatment centers in my life. Um, mm. Not proud of that, but you know, the VA continue had to take me because I'm a veteran. Right. So that's why I was able to go to that one a lot. And I went to uh, some other ones in Virginia, um, <clears throat> but just in and out, in and out on uh, uh, jails, institutions. And I've been to jails, penitentiaries, pen, uh, <clears throat> did all that. Uh, wasn't, wasn't raised that way, so had to learn how to survive. Mm. Um, my athletic skills kept me from so kept me surviving, and my Christianity. 
um, because I ended up doing Bible studies and I ended up playing ball. I was pretty decent. So when I was younger then, so it kept, you know, it kept me in a good place with people. So I need to pause you for the good folks. So at what point did you accept Christ? So you said in your Christian. (laughs) Wow. I ended up up accepting Christ at about 14 or 15 in my father's church. Gotcha. Um, Yeah. So I tell people all the time, you know, I, um, I teach now and I tell people you can't judge a person's Christianity, which is internal based off of some of the actions they're doing. Uh, they're still in the flesh and their, their flesh hasn't caught up to their spirituality yet. So, um, and they are still fighting that battle internally. Um, and cause there'll be people in heaven that you thought were, would be there that won't be there. And those you mm. thought wouldn't be there will be there. Wow. And um, so I've learned not to judge a person. And I think a lot of things I learned, um, I learned from um, my, my personal experience. This is one of them just quickly. Um, I got into the Bible when I was in the penitentiary. Mm-hmm. I realized some of the doctrinal stuff I had heard over the years were different than what the Bible taught. Mm-hmm. And so then it also allowed me to explore and to meet other people in other religions Muslims and I started getting along and understanding and it broadened my thought process as to how to see the text and then how to see other religions, which I'm not going to go there today, but it's just that, you know, and, and I saw where I'm more acceptable of allowing people to be where they are in their process. Okay. So, um, so needless to say, you know, in and out of jails, <clears throat> back and forth, getting high, going back. And I never forget this one time I had, um, I had three years backup time in Virginia mm-hmm. and um, I'm on probation this time again. Um, and I caught four new charges in Washington, DC. Mm. And I'm walking, I'm, I'm getting high, going around with no ID. Cause if you stop me, I got warrants on me. Right. And, um, I never forget they stopped me and I accidentally had my ID on me. I'm telling him one thing and he finds my ID, runs it, and that's it. <clears throat> so I end up going I going this time and I, I'm I never forget it's a thing called the bullpen. The bullpen is a little cage that's behind the judge's chamber. We've seen people, the, the prisoners come out of the back. That's a there's a cage, there's a cell back there. Oh, okay. It's called the bullpen. Okay. So I never forget, I had what is called this Gideon Bible in my pocket. Yes. And I was reading the Bible and I learned two things. It was just that that moment, God taught me how my feelings are dictated by my thinking. Mm -hmm. Because I responded, reacted instinctively based off my feelings. I'm fearful but when I got to reading the Bible and I started reading as I was back there, my feelings changed mm. because of what I was thinking in my mind, which is the word of God at that moment. Mm-hmm. I said, I got something here. Then I said, you know what, God? I said, I'm going to be in here a while. I'm about to miss my, my, my um, children's high school graduation and college graduation. Mm-hmm. That's how long I knew I was facing. Wow. And I said, all of your charges were drug charges, uh, drugs and stealing. I'll go in stores yeah. and steal to get high, but they're all connected to drugs. Yes. Okay. So, um, I never forget. I said, God, I'm not asking you to get me out of this. All I want to say, I'm done. And whatever you want me to do, I'm willing, I'm submitted to do it. Mm. now. That's all I said. And I went in front of the judge. He sent me someplace. I ended up doing 21 days in jail, 21. And I've days, days, I'm I'm facing years and I've never looked back. 21 days, I never forget. They sent me to two treatment centers. And when I went to see the lady in Virginia, the other judge, she said, well, I'm not gonna put you, she said, since this first judge in DC sentenced you, I'm going to send you, let you go with that sentence. You come back after six months after you get it. I said, no problem. I come, when I finish everything, I go to both judges. They put me on probation. And the last lady said, I hope I never see you again. I said, miss, I'm sorry. You're going to see me again. She said, what are you talking about? I said, next time I come, I won't be me. 
defending me. I'm going to be here as an advocate for somebody else. The lady just Hallelujah. looked at me. <laughs> <laughs> the just looked at me, but I was serious then. Uh -huh. and, um, that was my role. That was the turning point. Wow. And people, people, that was a, that's like the switch. You know, it wasn't all the treatment centers. I made a decision to say it was over. Now, that doesn't mean I didn't have, I went to treatment, learned about me then. Right. So they understanding how I operate, what I think, how I process, uh -huh. and learn how to change my thinking, be transformed, be conform, don't be conformed to the world, be transformed by the yes, renewing of yes. your mind. Yes. I had to change all my thinking. Yes. So um, then life started changing. Got, you know, uh, when I was in my addiction, I had this good job, man. I was traveling, doing a whole lot of stuff. And uh I was in sales saying, man, I wish I could ever get that job to travel again. And um, I know I'm saying that because this happened recently and God showed me he gave me the job back and I couldn't understand it. Uh -huh. um, because today, you know, 9-11 um, had hit uh -huh. and I started getting these trial charges. I couldn't get work in the computer field anymore like I used to because they go in the backgrounds and they would disqualify right. me. So I said, okay, nobody won't hire me. I'll hire myself. I'll open up my own business. So, <laughs> okay, okay. So I started doing consulting. I've been doing that for you all my life. You know, now. So you're a computer consultant. Yeah, I do. I have uh, I've, I've contracts. still have contracts in DC. That's why I'm about to tell you. So I, I travel a lot. I just travel once a month. Um, now I kind of backed off maybe two, twice a month, once every two months. I have a contract here. I got a guy work for me here and I'm traveling. I never was on a plane. And when I go there, I got to cram so much work within like a five or six days that I get very little sleep and I'm not getting any younger. I remember getting out of the car and said, Mike, you can't do this no more. You know, you, you just get too old to be getting out of cars and get three, oh, four I'm hours I'm glad you sleep. said that to yourself because I was about to tell it to you, but you said it. You know, amen. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, you just get too over this. So uh, I, I don't, I, I know my next trip is in December, but you know, because people knew me back then in DC and know what I do now, because I work at a treatment center here, you know, every time I go, I have to preach. So I preach there um, because, I, you know, when well, I'm there and then, um, and I do work and then I come back. So in the midst of all that, I got divorced, I, I got married. Uh, again, and um, wife's from Barbados. And um, so, you know, I think we've been married 10 years. I said, I think, boy, if she was hearing me, she'd be bad. Oh, yeah, you in for it. You know this is going all over the world, right? Oh, yeah, you in. Oh, yeah. You got it. Well, about 10 I years think. and uh, 10, 11 years. So things are, you know, 91, it'll be 11 years this year. So I got Congratulations. it. Congratulations. Yeah, I guess that. Uh, so, uh, but the key is, um, you know, things, you know, there's ups and downs, everything. I'm in the minute. I work at the ministry. That's a 24 seven job dealing right. with guys that's like me. Right. Uh, then doing my own thing on the side and um, and then just ministering and preaching. So, you know, I uh, got a grandson trying to run with him sometimes, you know, uh, don't get over there like I should. Um, that's convicting because it wasn't in my kid's life as I wanted to be. Because you know, I mean, I was a I was a youth pastor at one point. I taught high school. I coached basketball, um, but because of my addiction, it kept me out of their lives. Um, not because I wanted to. It's just that I was in a bondage at the moment. It was in a um, now I'm fighting back at my age, and so I have to work hard now. Uh, where I should be calming down, going on on the decline. I'm still kind of, still kind of got to get out there and grind, you know, at these at my age, and so which stops me from going to see my grandson as often as I like. But um, I got to just make that change and just say, hey, it is what it is. If it, whatever I don't make, don't make. Just keep it moving, you know. Right, so um, right. uh, that's I know awesome. I need... Well, I'm very proud of you. Um, <laughs> I'm proud of God. Hey. <laughs> Amen. I'm proud of the God in you, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So um, I, I've gotten a lot out of this, and I'm sure the good folks out there has too, to see that that you at an early age, you trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, but you didn't yield to the Holy Spirit that mm. is inside of you to yes. be able to accomplish what you have accomplished now. Yes. And so it's really weird because I, I um, you know, about the bull pit thing, I didn't know that. <laughs> And uh, oh Lord, God spoke to him in the bullpit. <laughs> so God, I meet you where you're at. 
Y'all good folks out there here. Where, me where you are. Okay. Yeah. Let me tell you. Can I tell you a quick story? Yes. Real, tell real, me. Tell me. Um, at this point, I'm in I'm in the penitentiary and um, a place called Lawton, Virginia. Uh huh. And um, my mother may be about in her seventies at the moment, in her late seventies. So. Uh -huh. Um, you know, at this place, I, nobody's coming to visit you, you know, so um, they call me out, say, you got to visit. I'm like, visit? So I go and I'm sitting in this room, the door opens, and it's my mother. Uh -huh. I still haven't stopped crying. <laughs> wow. I cried from when she walked in until, the day, until she walked out, and she continued to say, why are you crying? Why are you crying? <laughs> oh, I never get that like I was yesterday. And what happened, she had come um, because my life had been spiraling the way it had been going. Uh, I'm the only child, so everything outside of that was in my name and her. I think my father had passed, so in my name, my father passed when I was in the military and um, in our name, so she had to take stuff out of my name. So if I did something real crazy, they couldn't come back and take her house and stuff because my name's on everything. Right. So I uh, didn't have a problem with it, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I, I I understood it. I mm -hmm. wasn't mad, you know, just you do what I had. To. You owned it. Uh, you took responsibility. Yeah, I took responsibility, owned it, yeah. signed it, kept crying, you know. Uh, you know, I, I never forget that day. Uh, I never forget that day. And I, I say that to say I'm going to fast forward. Um, when I came back to New Orleans, um, my mother's gotten older. She couldn't do what she used to do. Um, my children in high school, my ex-wife lives at the house. And um, I was traveling back and forth, setting up her doctor's appointments while I travel, come in, send her to the, go to go with her to the doctor's, go back, get her next appointments, set my schedule to fly back to, to handle that. Got to a point I was doing it so much, I said, why did I come home? Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up coming back home and I ended up, you know, managing our finances, doing stuff like that. Uh, and I never forget this one day we were in the living room and she said, Mike, let's take a look at the finances. And so I took the computer, showed it on the TV, we we're going through. And then she said, she turned to me. She said, I never thought I'd see this day. I said, what you talking about? I never thought I'd see the day that you would have gotten your life together. And I'm just grateful and proud that you got your life together. And, um, you know, it brings tears when I start to talk about it. So yeah, I'm yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm about to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to catch myself now. So uh, I never forget that. I never forget that day. And then she said, Mike, I took all that stuff out to them. I'm going to put some, um, put things back and put some things back in your name. Never forget that. So um, four months later, she passed. Mm. And um, wow. I'm okay. The, the stuff in my name didn't matter. All I needed to hear was that. I, you got your life together. I'm proud of what you're doing. Yes. Keep up the good work. That was worth a million dollars to me. Yes, of course. So, I mean, that that alone, and I never forget a good friend in D.C. called Tony Dougie. I never forget, I mentioned his name, but he, I never forget when I was thinking about coming home, he says, and I had so much going on up there, he said, you need to go home. He says, you need to get back with your moms and reconcile. That's going to be the that's going to be the ceiling of your recovery. He says, you need wow. to go home. He kept telling me that. And I, I followed his advice on that. Wow. And, and I did that and has been. And um, that moment, that moment in that living room, I've never forgotten. Wow. Um, and that was what I was seeking for, to hear she said, I'm proud of you all those years. Yes. And it came to four months before she passed because of just, just not getting, just getting my life together. Right, you know? right. So um, I just had to do it in that, that part. No, no, there, that part. You know, I'm, I'm listening to you because I, I, I wrote a book, you know that, and it's yes. uh, determined to discover why. And I heard mm -hmm. you say on the last clip, you know, you just was trying to find out why, just asking God why. So you're telling my story as well. And the, about the mother story, that that was, my mom and I never had a fallout or anything, but she has some issues that she hadn't dealt with. She's passed right. away now. And those issues that she 
dealt with that she had going on caused her to have that sense of insecurity as well, even at an mm. older age. However, I did not know that. Okay. Mm. So the behavior that she exhibited toward me was due to some things in her past that I had no clue about. Mm -hmm. And I was mm -hmm. trying to understand why, why, why are you tripping? Why are you treat me like this? Right. <laughs> and so this is so keen. I, I would pray, you know, Lord, you know, I, I just need to sit down and talk to her, you know, make that happen. I want to be like this with my mom. Cause everybody, mama love Marion, right? And I wanted my mom to feel that way about me. Now, not saying wow. that she didn't like you wow. said, but right. this is what I felt. And I tell mm. people all the time, feelings are real. They may not necessarily be true, but they uh, are. Let me, give you a, let me give you a little quick, a little, little yeah. thing I have. Yeah. It's a fact that I have a feeling, but not all my feelings are facts. That's correct. That is correct. <laughs> that is so correct. It's a fact that I have feelings, but all my feelings are not facts. Not I got facts. that. I got that. I like that. And so, yeah, so my feelings were they were real you know mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. i prayed because i knew that i prayed i said lord i know you want me to have this like relationship with my mom you know that i'm supposed to have because i wanted to travel with her and every time i asked her to go somewhere i was gonna pay for everything she'd be like oh baby no i don't feel oh that's on my that's not on my schedule i'm like what schedule you got <laughs> my daddy <laughs> I'm like, what schedule you got? but she was dealing with her own self you understand mm -hmm. And, and I didn't know. So I prayed and I asked God to make that situation happen. And listen to you, you were retelling my story. <laughs> my girlfriend said to me, girl, we, um, my family and I, we going on a cruise uh, and, and uh, a lot of people didn't show up. So she knew I was a networker. She said, you ought to come, go round up some people. Well, you ain't got to say it, tell me twice. So I went to calling people. <laughs> and another friend of mine, who is my wow. very dear friend. I've since lost her as the friend she was, but uh, mm. she's not dead, but you know, we ain't like we I got, you. I got you. But anyway, I said, girl, let's go on a cruise. She said, I'm scared. I said, me too. I ain't never been on a cruise. <laughs> so we went on a cruise mm -hmm. and we had the, a lifetime, a ball. But here's wow. the thing, God used it, that cruise to answer mm. my prayer that I had been praying about my mom. Let me tell you how. I had just bought a car. I put 80,000 miles on that car in less than a year. That's crazy. But I did wow. a lot of traveling. Okay. And the car went out on my way to New Orleans. I'm like, Lord, what? my transmission. I'm like, why? Why? Everything was about why with me. That's why I wrote the book. Mm. And so I said, God, what you want me to do? Is it somebody want me to share Jesus with? I got stuck on Highway 190 in Baton Rouge. Everybody come through. I was telling them about Jesus. Lord, this is what you want me to do? <laughs> I got to get to New Orleans to go to cruise. <laughs> Long story short, Michael, we get to New Orleans. Uh -huh. I actually had a fr another friend, another friend that I hadn't talked to in 10 years. That's a girlfriend. That's really a friend. She and her husband lived in Baton Rouge. I told uh -huh. her I was stranded in Baton Rouge. She sent her daughter to pick me up two hours and drive me all the way to New Orleans. That's a friend, ain't it? Wow, yes. So she took me to New Orleans, dropped me off at my brother's. My brother said, where you want to go? Guess where I went? To my mother's. He dropped me off at my mother's, but I didn't have mm. a car. I didn't have a car. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. I didn't have a car. And uh -huh. see, people don't understand you got to be careful what you pray for. Now, mind you, I prayed about mm. this relationship that I wanted to have with my mother. So in the interim, God allows me to have go on a cruise, come to New Orleans, and my car is gone. So all of a sudden, here I am again. Mm -hmm. Now, my daddy died. So it's nobody but me and my mother. I said, mother, I go on to tell her, you know, we need to talk. Da, 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 da. I said, mother, you want me to do it? So and so, so and so, I need my car washed. I need, I said, I got it. I'll do it. No, baby, don't do that. It ain't on my schedule. What schedule? <laughs> Everything I asked her to do, she, she said no. And that's when God revealed it to me in the kitchen. I would jump in my car, Michael, normally and just drive off because I was mad because I wanted her to let me do for her. And right. she wouldn't but she wouldn't because of what she was dealing with that I knew nothing of. But mm -hmm. I didn't know that. So to me, it was like, why are you doing this? Mm -hmm. But all of a sudden, I didn't have a car to run. Wow. That's where I was going. I didn't have a car to run. And so I had to sit there because I usually wow. ran. I ran 
when God mm. brought me face to face with it, I would run because mm. I didn't want to deal with it. But God right. caused the car to go out so I wouldn't have no car. Couldn't run. Can't run. Couldn't run no more. And I tell you, those three days I was stranded. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I stayed here 16 days without a car. Wow. And the three days I was stranded before I went on the cruise, had a chance to talk to my mother. And my mother revealed some things to me that, Lord Jesus, I was clueless. And I thought about it when you were talking. And when mm -hmm. she told me what she told me, which is her business, she's in glory. I said, so that's why you've been acting like you've been acting. She ain't know that though. I said, but I was three. I don't even remember that. I was three. She was dealing with something that happened when I was two and three. I don't even remember. And so I was like, okay. <laughs> Y'all been getting a bad rap here. So here, here, here's my point. The why. I prayed that I would be closer to my mother. That would never have happened had the Lord not taken my dad. Mm. My dad was my best friend, business partner, best friend. That was the best five years of my life before my mother died that I had with her. So when you were talking about your friend told you to go and, and that was my best five years of my, of my life with my mother as an adult. Yes, yes. As an adult, yeah. And even in that time, you know, we actually got a chance to, uh, we, we had, we have family, you know, gatherings, Thanksgiving and all that. That was the first one in 2017. And when I tell you, we had an amazing time. It was so good. My, my baby son is six, three, four, six, three. Yeah. And my mom was four eleven. <laughs> he went and got his grandmother and brought her to the gathering. And she had no idea I was going to come. And so she walked in the door. Oh, you never lie here. You told me you weren't coming. <laughs> I was there. But anyway, I've just taken your story. Um, <laughs> that's, okay. that's okay. No, 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 no. That's fine. That's yeah, fine. But I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say this because I caught this from you just now, and I've always done um, this analyzation or this analyzation. This many days, I, I'm angry. I get angry about this particular point. I say, um, there's moments uh, that I think, why did I have to go through those? moments of jails, penitentiary, and yes. you know, using and losing and gaining and, 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 and rejection. Why did, it, why did it all happen? So it's always reflective of the text that says all things work together for yes. the good. And I realized that when I counsel, preach, and teach uh, at the ministry, uh, you know, I deal at Bethel, right? That's where I'm at now. And, um, you know, I'm all. I always have a story connected to whatever we're discussing. Whatever you're discussing. Too much. Um, and I said, well, this is what it is. It's the experience and the wisdom that is drawn from the pain of my past. Amen. And I never thought that through that pain it could be productive. You know, I always thought it was something people say, just forget it all, just leave it, don't touch it. But that's part of what God uses to help heal others that's is through right. the pain of what you had gone through. So Amen. all the things you, you discussed, you started going through and you do things like this and other things that you do when you go to Africa. Um, and, and it's because of your experiences yeah. that gives you the passion to do yes. what you do. And, um, and I think that keeps us going. Um, you know, keeps me going in my old age, yes. you know, so yes. uh, you still 25, you you're still 25. Age, you I say old. you still, see, you still 25 and still running, you understand? Know so, I mean, I'm trying to, I'm he trying old. <laughs> He old, y'all, he old. But no, that's absolutely true. That's so <laughs> true. You know, Romans 8, 28, that is so true. And that is what yeah. my book is about, Determined to Discover mm. Why. You know, when you look at things in your life, you know, the choices that you make, be dumb choices right just so yeah. dumb at least mine was like dumb the real dumb and but the point is i remember those dumb things i remember them and i get to pull them out of the hat mm. and minister to whoever it is that needs them right. not because i i thought about it but because i've gone through it right. because i could feel what you feel 
because I see what you see. I understand what you understand, but this is where I am now and this is how I got here. That's my story when I talk to people. You know, when I minister to them, I too do the consulting. I'm a coach. So I'm like, okay, all right. And so at the end of my book, God answers the why of some of the mm-hmm. pain that I had gone through. Because I was mad with the Lord. I know none of y'all out there ain't never been mad with the Lord, but I was mad with God. Amen. I'm telling the truth with a F. We just keeping it real. So anyway, Michael, I thank you for your story. And I have something that I would like for you to say to the good folks out there. Okay. I want you, what would you say? What would mm. you say to the only children, whoever's an only child, what would you say to them? Because I'm sure that at some point they've felt that insecurity, that that longing to belong. Um, what would you say to them right now? And the mm. second thing, the second thing is what would you say to mothers out there and fathers? That's a loaded question. Only children um, and mothers. Yeah. Um, two things, uh, mothers and fathers, I kind of know that one on top of my head. The other one, um, you're never alone. And that's easy for me to say that out of my mouth and by theory, because this lonely feeling is really deep down within. Um, and um, wow, what would I say? Uh, reach out to reach, even though you may seem like you are alone, um, you reach out to wholesome people and you still have to be somewhat selective in your connections. Mm. Now, young kids can't understand that. Right. Um, all they know is they need connection. It's not about selection. Um, but uh, yeah, here it is, because I'm going to tie the two. So therefore, communicate. Um, that's where the parents create an environment that is so close-knit and um, that we're entwined with each other's lives where they still feel the nurture of home. Mm. So to the father and mother who has an only kid, um, they have to continue to allow the kid to express where they are, um, not judgmental as how can you feel that way? Don't you see X, Y, Z? Right. No, it's real that you feel it. And, you know, then get into the world of the kid um, with it, it, without trying to be controlling. That's hard though. Trying to be controlling, letting them experience life but also being connected enough that the communication is open, that we're able to talk, uh, do more family thing oriented things. Okay. Um, you know, because that that helps the kid feel that. Okay, sorry. Here's the best thing for parents: validate the kid for that you love them for just being them. Not that not has nothing to do with their performance. There you go. I mean, performance at school, performance in there sports, performance in any way. I love you. There's a quick illustration, biblical, Jesus, if you know the story, gets uh, baptized by John the Baptist. He comes out the water. God gets on the microphone. He says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Here is the text that if you look at the where it's located, Jesus had not performed any miracles. He had not done mm-hmm. anything. He said, I love him. This is my son. I'm validating who you are, even without you doing anything. Amen. I validate who you are. So I think yes. that's where my thing was. Thank and then because that's what lonely kids look for validation. Yes, yes. I'm done. Yes, I could yes. talk long, so I'm gonna stop being quiet. No, you're good. You're good. Thank you so much. And <laughs> what would you say to the parents? That's the parents. Just um validate your kids, you know, love them for who they are. Um, I'm stri- I'm pushing you to do your best, but um I'm still going to accept you. Uh, even in the midst, I'm going to accept you for who you are. That's it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much once again. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I really yes. appreciate it. We had fun, didn't we? I did. I yeah. did. I accepted it. Yeah. Well, this is DTM Real Talk, and yeah. we're just doing what? 
Keeping it Keeping real. real. Hey, See you next week. Bless you. Thank you so much, Michael, for your transparency, for your honesty, just for being you, just for being who you are. And um, you're a clear example of um, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You're, you're a perfect example of that, how that you were in that bull pit and how God spoke to you and how the Holy Spirit that lived inside of you from the very first day that you accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, that you um, trusted in Christ alone. He lived inside of you, but you didn't listen to him. And then in the bull pit, you just decided to humble yourself. So I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for the pain that you have gone through um, that you have used to, 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 to add value to others because you have experienced it. So thanks so much for that. And I want to speak to you guys out there. If you have a story, reach out to me at dtmrealtalk at gmail.com, dtmrealtalk at gmail.com. Reach out to me there. And we'd love to hear your story. And if you haven't gotten my book, Determined to Discover Why, it is on Amazon. So you can go there. And like Michael, I had a whole lot of whys. Why, why? And some of the decisions I made, like I said, was so stupid. But God even used those and gave me beauty for my ashes. So today I'm in a place of freedom. And I want you to be too. You guys enjoy the rest of your day on purpose. DTM Real Talk. Be sure to join us for more conversation. And oh yeah, don't forget to hit that like button, share, and subscribe while you're there.